Thanks for staying with us. So Nigeria has a high um, <coughs> prevalence of mental health issues, according to the World Health Organization. An estimated one in four Nigerians experience a mental health disorder in their lifetime. This means that mental health issues are a major public health issue in Nigeria, and it's important for everyone to be aware of them. More importantly, health issues can be passed down from one generation to the next. This is known as intergenerational transmission of mental health problems. There are a number of ways that this can happen, including genetics, exposure to trauma, and unhealthy coping mechanisms. Today, we'll be um, attempting to demystify mental health and digging into intergenerational mental health awareness for Nigeria. Please let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 0818-038-4663. Um, tweet at us or send us a message on X um, at Wayshow Africa one with the hashtag Wayshow. Mental health. Um, we've talked about mental health, but yeah. I like this concept of... In fact, I think when I saw the title, I was like, intergenerational mental health. Are we talking about the mental health of the Gen Zs? You know, I can't. I, I just, yeah, yeah, I can't. Or are we talking about so this concept of what intergenerational um, meant? And then I saw that, interestingly enough, it can be passed down. Um, not something I had thought, of, thought about uh, consciously. But then when I saw this, I thought, actually, it's true because... In fact, the one that I really would like our, our guests to talk about today is the impact of, in marriages, you hear a lot of people say, oh, we're staying together for the children. Yeah. And then, you know, I know people who, like, what, they're, they're older and they're just like, I wish you guys had just split up. Like, you literally, that house was the original Fuji House of Coalition and it was just, you know, stressful and, you know, I'm dealing with issues now from it. But what are your thoughts and any experiences around, you know, the impact of, you know, intergenerational issues when it comes to mental health? Um, I've not had like a direct experience, but I think I heard about, my dad had told me about one of his cousins who had a mental breakdown and he just disappeared. They just could not find him anymore. And as time went on, Although he had a child, then they found out that <clears throat> as the child was growing, I think when the child was a teenager or a young adult, he started to experience similar, similar symptoms. Mm. So for that um, particular child, it just meant that they needed to nip it in the bud mm -hmm. as soon as possible. So that got me thinking, and it kind of like just got me scared. You know, sometimes when before you get married, People tend to tell you, oh, run tests, ask yeah. questions, right? Yeah. You need People to find out, yes. Things, but there's things to Yeah, to find out if there has been um, some form of traumatic, um, trauma, tra traumatic experience in that family. Mm -hmm. Who has what, who has experienced what, so that way you know, right? So that by the time you're in that marriage and you probably have a child, you start to notice those signs. Yeah. You yeah. tend to attack it. From young before it just blows out of proportion mm. but then that's 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 basically yeah. it it's interesting to learn um, more about that is he any thoughts hi is he are you there yes i'm here yeah so i was just saying I haven't, just wait. yes i haven't experienced anyone with that um mental situation but like jennifer said i have um heard about something like that you know, being passed from generation to generation, especially a situation whereby a son is exhibiting the same attributes or character or features that the father must have done. Maybe, for example, the father had some sort of mental breakdown when he, as a child and he, um, as an adult, and he passed it on to the children while beating them up and all that. Yeah. And the child you know, tends to, you know, grow up and become just like his father, exhibiting the same traits as the father. Yeah. So, yes, I have heard about it, but I haven't actually seen it um, firsthand, okay. basically. All right, so it looks like we have a lot of questions lined up for our guest. Um, Kemi Shokwe Agbebi is a multi-potentialite, I love it, <laughs> <laughs> with a commitment to helping broken people find healing at the intersection of her interests. She leads the team at Room 707, a support group for people finding comfort from grief, depression, addictions, and abuse. Started in 2021, the group has since coached more than 300 people who have passed through the therapy program while at the same time driving their Catching Them Young project. 
um, targeted at secondary school students, equipped with a pharmacy degree and an MBA from a global business school. She is currently the global head. Um, She's currently the global head of special projects at M Pharma, a pioneering health tech company spanning Africa. Thank you for joining us, um, Kemi. We're very excited to have you on the show. Very happy to be here. Thank awesome. you so much. Awesome. So I, I, when I was looking through your profile and I saw that um, you started this in, in 2021 in the current construct, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, so this is post-COVID. So it's not even like this was, you started it at the height of when it was really needed because everybody was coming off those, um, those high, those, when I say highs, not highs, the downs or the lows of um, COVID and the mental it's stress crazy. and all of that that mm -hmm. was happening there. But what was it that was happening in Nigeria that led you down that path of wanting to tackle something as big as mental health? Hmm. Um, I think that for me, it was beyond just um, Nigeria. It's something that I had experienced. I mean, from childhood, attempted suicide like two or three times. Um, I lost my mom in 2018, lost my dad last year. It was crazy, right? It's a crazy thing. It's a crazy place to be. And so from that experience, right, first and I'm like, when I lost my mom, I wanted every, anybody to experience what I was experiencing, right? I wanted people to suffer, right? But it was very different over time when I found healing and then I couldn't stand anybody going through suffering that way. But I need to mention this, right? So Room 707 had actually started from my church. You know, it's a young people's church. And um, so you can imagine that a, a, a church environment where you have People are supposed to have hope and things like that, yet they were experiencing really, really crazy mental health issues, right? Mm -hmm. And so at some point, um, I mean, the vision grew bigger and we knew that we needed to take it outside of the walls of the church. And the response has been huge, huge mm -hmm. very huge. And that's why I really love the topic that you selected. But when I got that topic, I said, wow, this is amazing, right? I, I feel like we need to create awareness as to how bad our intense mental health issue is, especially with young people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Especially with young people. And this is why it's, it's important, because of the tendency for it to be intergenerational, yeah. right? And so if you reach it early enough, at the point of early development, then there's a chance that that child will not grow and continue that cycle and transfer it into his own, mm. into, I mean, into their own kids, right? But right now, what we're seeing now is a very, very intense um, effect or, you know, so I'll say this to you, I have a science background. Typically, most of the behaviors that you, you develop or you exhibit mm. It's passed to you either from genetics, hereditary, or the environment. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to, even, that? Uh, now that you've mentioned it, maybe a good time to, def to mm. define mm -hmm. what that intergenerational mental health looks like. Is it passed down by, like you said, genetics? It, can it be part of what you, know, you pass down to your child? Mm -hmm. Or can it be that as a parent, you have a traumatic situation, and then the way you're treating your child then creates that? So just maybe give us some, some insight. Now, so what that. the environment... Uh, sorry, what the children of now are experiencing is a combination of the two, and that's why right. it's really, really little. So, yes, science, basically that background, you will transfer it through genetics, yeah, hereditary, it's very key, right? And then it can be augmented by the environment, right? You know, so there are certain traits that can pass into a child through genetics, and somehow along the part of that child, the environment can cross correct it. Mm. If the environment is now empowering it, then you even find the child exhibiting even more serious symptoms than the parents did. Mm. Right. And that's why today you have a lot of young people that break easily. You hear them, and these are people that are, have counseled, right? You, tell, you hear them, they've attempted suicide. You know that they're thinking of it two, three times. Why are you thinking about killing yourself? Oh, I'm not where I'm supposed to be, 23, mm. 20 years old. What led you along this path, you know? Oh, right from when I was age seven, I didn't think I was loved, I was this and all of that. You know, so you see that the environment has augmented what is already at work or at play in the life of the child that she doesn't even realize 
and so they find themselves along that path and then you see a lot of anxiety depression cases why because many times if a child was exposed to childhood trauma mm. or from a very turbulent family mm -hmm. already is at a disadvantage mm. because the environment is empowering a circle that is at work whether she's um, aware or not he or she's aware or not yeah. you see so most of the time they will end up with anxiety depression issue repeating the circle and even in a greater effect than the parents did yeah. and then if you're not careful then they pass continue to pass that on to their children so that's what intergenerational uh, mental health is anything that is intergenerational just means that it has impact across generations Right, and so that's what we're saying there. That's what it is. Mm. Um, Jennifer, I think, I think maybe we'll come to Issy before um, we we'll come back to the show. Okay. Hi, Issy. Hello. Um, hi, Kemi. Well hi. said. I, I totally enjoyed your breakdown of what intergenerational um, mental health awareness is all about. Now, I, I told a story about a 14 year old girl who actually committed suicide. And you know you were quite lucky to have um, um, attempted it, but didn't go through with it. I thank God you're here today. First things first. So I I need you to throw more light on how if there there are there are teens that are going through something or going through some sort of anxiety or depression currently, based on the fact that they they have a, an environment that is not assisting them or helping them what would you say to them to help them get through that um, situation or depression that they're going through currently? So I feel like the first step is really awareness, which is why I love what um, Plus TV is trying to do about just creating awareness. It's for you to first, at the level of awareness, you've even solved um, a very great percentage of the issue. Just being aware that this is um, what my reality is right now. I'm, I'm actually, there's something like anxiety, there's something like depression, and that looks like what I'm experiencing. So first is that awareness, understanding um, what the identity is. That's one. Number two is, of course, to, to try to seek help, like a coach or therapy, you know. And that's why a place like Room 707 is, I mean, it's completely free, you know. Like I mentioned in my bio, we've... I um, actually had about 300 young people pass through the program, you know, so seek therapy. You, you can't really help yourself that much, you know, without therapy, without counseling, you know. So first, like I said, is the awareness, the awareness, and then seeking therapy. Now, let's try to demystify this idea of therapy because in Nigeria, we're talking Nigeria now, Many people feel that therapy is means that you're mad or something is wrong with you. Stigmatized. You know, so it's that's not what it is, really. Mm. You know, in fact, most of the time, therapists, when I counsel people, they, the answers are within them, only that they can't see it. They mm. can't help themselves. You know, it's like you're drowning in water and you can't get yourself out. Yeah. You know, so the therapy just helps you to separate the person from the problem. And that's what I try to do with them separate the person from the problem. This is the problem. There are many addictions um, victims. Addiction, by the way, is also transgenerational. Mm. Yeah, so if your parents, any of your parents suffer from an addiction, there's a chance that they've passed those genes to you, and that's why you're struggling with pornography or masturbation. So imagine you, you're struggling with masturbation, and you're not even aware about this, this tendency. But you're trying hard. You don't like it. You don't enjoy it that much. You feel bad. That's what I see with them. They feel bad after they engage in the heart. They are not happy, and for societal cases as well, they are not happy that they are not happy. They can't just get themselves out, right? Mm. But just the mere fact that, oh, there's a chance that this actually passed on for my parents, mm. you know, that helps you to start seeing it outside of you, the person, the problem. The problem is addiction. The problem is anxiety and depression. It doesn't mean that there's a problem with me. Mm. By the time you unify the person and the problem, then we have a big problem, <laughs> you know. And so that's when a typical societal victim will tell you, you know what, I'm, I, there's nothing I can do. I can't help myself. I'm just going to kill myself, right? Mm -hmm. So it's awareness, one, seek therapy. And therapy is just going to help you um, separate the person from the problem. And then we start dealing with the problem, yeah. 
know that there's something wrong with the person. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. hmm. Thank you. Thank you for shedding more light on that. So I have a question around grief. Mm. Right. You had talked about um, <clears throat> when your mom passed away. And I know that there are, there are a couple of people who are probably going through something mm -hmm. like that, people who are dealing with grief. But, <clears throat> sorry. So basically what I want to know is, how's the cycle, how does the cycle of grief work? And as, as individuals, how do we help those who are close to us through that entire process? Like, you know, sometimes when, when somebody passes away, people never really know what to say, huh. right? People never know what to do because there's no amount of sorry, there's no amount of, of, of petting or, or affection or compassion you want to give to that person in that moment that is going to heal their hearts mm. or that's going to make them feel better. But I know that sometimes even when that is happening, people still want to help you because nobody wants you to go down that dark hole because you never know if they're ever going to come out of it so what i'm asking is first of all what is the cycle of grief right how do we identify that and how do we help people through it yeah um interesting question thank you for that grief is um as about four stages there's the, the one on the first one on denial you know that phase where you know it's just really hard for them to accept what is what is really going on and i say this to people that no death experience leaves you the same <laughs> it's 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 crazy right it's crazy i don't think there's any amount of what i mean the word you can say to them in that moment sometimes silence there's a lot of healing and power in just being there and being silent so imagine just sending a text i just want you to know that i'm here you know it may not make sense to them they may not ad it may not adapt at that point but over time i just want you to know that i'm here i just want you to know that um you could send a scripture you could send a good um a good quote that just something really soft and easy and don't try to put a pressure on them you know so grief is it doesn't leave you the same, you know. Like when I lost my dad last year, he had cancer. And just watching, you know, somebody that you love, um, life seep out of him, right? Um, it was crazy, man. So, but the truth is, somebody asked me, how did you survive losing your dad? I mean, it's the third time. I lost my sister, I lost my dad. And it's just five of us, so you can imagine, right? I said, oh, I didn't survive losing my dad. I, I just became a different person. That's it. And, and this person is whatever it would take to comfort somebody that is grieving. Because sometimes when I lost my mom, the one person that really could, could get to me, there are several people coming to say a lot of them, was a, 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 an aunt that lost an, a mom too. And then she just said, when I lost my mom, and then she starts, I could feel the energy. It was very real. It was different than mm -hmm. people that not me really experienced it. You know, that was the one person that could get to me. And then she gave me a deep hug. I doubt if she ever knew how therapeutic our words and that hug was for me in that moment. But I never forgot it. You know, so for me now, it's just using my own experience, you know, to reach out to them. So m most of the time, I realize that it's so easy for me to connect with people that agree. Because I've experienced it. Some things are better experienced than explained. Mm -hmm. Right? It doesn't leave you the same you already prepare as a friend or whatever role you it is to that person that this is not the same person i knew before that time you know so if you think she used to like flowers she used to like apples so let me just give her flowers and send her apples and stuff like that she, you can get there she's just not fling the flowers in your face you know and then you shouldn't have a problem with that because allow them one gives them the freedom for that transition because the transition is necessary and it will happen. Mm. If the transition doesn't happen, the person has not accepted it. It's in the face of denial. And you comfort somebody that's in the um, um, face of denial, it's just to be quiet, you know, just listen to them and all of that. Check in once in a while, you know. And then after that, you know, then you can start being more conscious about the new person that they have become mm. and even letting them know, you yeah. know, I know I'm just here for you um, regardless of what is on the other side but i'm here for you well wow. wow. thank if, you even just talking <laughs> about it here it, it, it's changing the energy at oh the table yeah, yeah. It's, it's so powerful exactly um and when you said it, it's 
better experience. I just thought to myself, I remember when my mom died, it was real when they were putting the coffin in the ground. Like, this oh, was where it became that's real. The like, yeah. She's, and I'm like, I can't follow her. This is the real point of goodbye. And it's just yeah. not something that, like I said, you can't explain it. You, it's only when you experience it that you understand it's it. The we should take a quick break um, and we'll be right back. Please stay with us. If you've just tuned in, we're discussing the topic What's Intergenerational this? Mental Health Awareness for Nigerians with Kemi Shakwe and Gabi. Please let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 018-038-4663. Tweet at us at Show Africa with the hashtag um, Show. So, uh, coming back to the generations and coming back to the reality of where we are today, um, when we first started the show, we were talking about the disparity in um, treatment opportunities. So hospitals, therapists, we already have a problem in the health sector. Then when you start to come down to that area, the ratios are even more critical. So given that you are now you know, plugging that gap in a way, talk to us a bit about how big that gap really looks like, what it looks like. The gap is... <laughs> is as wide as the gap you have when you have um, a parent that is sick, for example, and you can't even get a hospital bed, or you have an accident victim that you can't even get a hospital bed, right? So that's how wide the gap is. Now, for mental health, is even worse. Why? Because a lot of attention has not been devoted to that, um, um, you know, that health care. Yeah, it's, it has not been. But there are a few private organizations doing amazing things, and I'm really, really grateful and happy for that. But then I realized that hmm, they hardly have spaces. Mm. The mm. gap is terrible. And now I'm sure you, you guys are aware about how drug abuse is mm. so rampant. rampant among young people today. So we have a project called Catching Them Young, right? Mm -hmm. So the 300 I mentioned are basically young adults that have, are, you know, reached out to us and all of that. And at some point when I realized that from engagement with them, many of them were exposed from primary school, secondary schools, have been battling suicidal anxiety, whatever, addiction since lesbianism, since primary school, when I was the age of six, this happened to me, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, so we started that project called Catching Them Young, and then we started going to secondary schools. Because it's easier to heal somebody that has been bleeding for just a very short time than somebody that, that's even if they ever make it to adulthood. So when you talk about the gap now, right, the gap is as wide as the people currently suffering, right, can't even get as much help, and then Nobody is even trying to reach out to the younger generation. And guess what? Even parents, parents, what do I mean? Even teachers. I go to schools and they tell me, I'm so glad you guys are here because we can't handle it on our own. Is that bad? And trust me, 80% to 90% of the young people I talk to, their parents have no idea. No idea. Mm. Yeah. They have no idea. And they don't even know how to manage it. That is how wide the gap is. Because mental health is in different stages and different levels. It's not everyone that requires or go to the clinic. In fact, some people have gotten worse from considering their option. Why? Because the parent didn't really know how to manage that information at that point. And then maybe a friend says, ah, why didn't you take her to a psychiatric clinic? And of course, when wow. she gets there, then she feels worse than... Because it just... I mean, I did my internship for one year as psychiatric clinic yeah, but <laughs> this is 2011 2011 every day we have close to 300 people struggling in fact the drugs are not enough things like that you know struggling struggling to get their drugs medication these guys look all featured up like not all of them look crazy that way mm -hmm. this is 2011 so if this is 2023 yeah, later. you can imagine and how many mental health facilities have been built between that time and now yeah if, and if, if I'm yet, stopping, okay. If I'm stopping, that you've you've talked about um, 
different things. But one thing that resonated with me was the fact that you said that we have younger ones who are, it's easier to handle younger ones who are going through what they're going through, not to talk of the the elder, the, the older ones, basically. Now, the older ones, we can't neglect them. We know that they are there. We have broken adults that are, they do not know how to handle themselves, but they have individuals who are living with them and trying to manage them. So how do you deal with these broken individuals? Yeah, sure. Okay, so for the older ones, right, basically is to seek help and to um, seek therapy, basically. But you see... No, the people who are dealing with them, how will they manage them? How This is for those who are living with these people who are already broken adults. So how will they manage them? Or the people living with them, right? The parents yes. and the family yes. members. Yeah. The parents and the family members. All right. Exactly. Okay, so not the parents now. It's not the parent that is broken. No. Oh, they are the young ones adults. Those who are already broken. Oh, great, great. So I mean, the first thing is not to freak out because that's what I see a lot these days, you know. And then the parents are just freaking out because they're like, "Where did this come from? How did we miss it?" And things like that. Is to first understand that again. It's as like your daughter has a headache or your daughter has typhoid mm. and you need to take her to the hospital to, to treat her. Mental health issue does not mean that, oh, that's a write-off. Where do I start from? And then you're freaking out because that's going to even make the situation worse for that person. You just separate well, the person. Where is the role of love there? Where is the role of love? The because role love of love. Huge role yeah, yeah. But there. you see... The parents, in fact, mo what I've seen most of the time, the parents freak out so much that they themselves get into a depression. They get into the... Exactly, they even get exactly, worse The cycle then comes into it, yeah. Yes, because they need to just be okay with knowing that sometimes mental health, like people are not, you know, in terms of their mental states is not that mm. optimum, right? They need to just be okay with that first. And okay. because... There are several factors that has led that child to that point. And trust me, it is not when you notice it. You know, it's the same thing with a symptom and a, a disease, right? Mm. A symptom and a disease, right? The symptom is as a result of the disease. If you take care of the symptom and the disease is still there, it's going to just come right back, mm. right? So okay. the first thing is not to freak out. Then I t say this to parents. I mean, I have three daughters, right? And I say this to parents that one of the best gifts you can give your children is an environment, you know, for them to be able to have conversations with you. There's so many things that conversation would do. Because even when you speak about love, if that environment had the capability to give love to that child the way he wanted, he wouldn't have found himself there in the first place. Yeah. So maybe the parents don't even, are not even capable. Yeah. Like I said, 90% of the children that speak to me the parents have no idea. In fact, and they are talking to a complete stranger. They are telling me yeah. details, everything. secrets, everything. Oh, when I was age of six, one says, um, my mom, she fell into depression because the parents wanted her to study science mm. instead of arts. Yeah. To the parents, when I spoke to the parent, because they somehow she found that, then she reached out to yeah. me. The parent told she was extending love to her that, hey, I'm more I mature, we are more mature teacher. than mm. you. We know you are smart, mm. analytical, we go into science. And somehow they moved her into science. To them, they were actually extending love to her. Yeah, yeah. But it affected her, a very small child, and over time she just started losing it academically. But you know, the, 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 what you just said now just leads so nicely into the question that I wanted to ask. If you look at the way we raise kids today, oh. and the way kids were raised, so what, because we're talking about intergenerational, right? Mm -hmm. These parents were raised in a very different way. Awesome. They were not raised with communication, with love, in the way that and you can't give what you don't have thank exactly. you so i wonder how you know that in itself is becoming a driver of what you're seeing mm -hmm. mm. i have young people today that call me mommy yeah mommy some of them are older like as old as i am and they say mommy 
they mm. identified more with me being mommy to them, even though they have their real mothers. Yeah, yeah. Because that open conversation that they can have with me, and it's ninety percent anonymous. Yes. They've never seen me, and they open up. Oh, wow. like, yes. So they don't even. They don't know me. Some yes. of them take the you know liberty to look for me for the first time you know mm. and when i see them i'm really always but they don't know me but the connection is so deep yeah imagine if the parents are the capability to give that to them because mm. they're seeing them physically mm. right so sometimes parents can't give what they don't have and like you said how we were raised i cannot raise my children yeah. Like yeah. see i have three daughters they came That's in different problem. generation mm. i already understand that they're in different i can't apply the same method that i use yeah. for one to yeah. raise the others in fact even myself in those three phases i've transitioned mm. i'm not the same mother that raised three of my kids yeah yeah but yeah. i need to be aware about you see awareness is so key like even parents in their identity they don't even know yeah. If they are not in the best state of mind, how do they even extend that to their How parents? can they do that? And, and the world really is so stressful at the moment. It's so I stressful. Mean, you know, they leave, you have parents that leave the well being of their children to nannies. Uh, yeah. Well being yeah. of their <laughs> children to the fact that they <laughs> paid expensive school fees. That is. Um, right, to their teachers. Yeah, that is a whole topic for a whole other show, and we're fast running out of mm -hmm. time. Um, Jennifer, I think you have a comment. Yeah, I was going to ask a question, but let me do my comment because mm. we're running out of time. Good evening, my dear beautiful sisters of what are you saying? Hashtag ways. I know this is the Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Intergenerational mental health awareness for Nigerians. Your beautiful guests make mention of two things that are very important. Number one, to create awareness concerning the intergenerational mental health. Number two, to demand for a therapy session for the person involved. It is solving the problem and not the person. Because there is nothing wrong with the person. My dear beautiful sister, E.C. said that generational causes are passed from parents to children. Thereby, the children begin to behave like the parents and copy their characters. Parents should be careful how they bring up their children to avoid regrets. This is very important. Sister mm -hmm. Uti, you look beautiful tonight. God bless you. My name is Daniel Iloway's regular fan. Thank you, Daniel. We really appreciate the love and the consistency. Mm -hmm. um, we have run out of time. So mm -hmm. my final comment or, or question or plea to you, Kemi, is please, we would like to have you back on the show. Mm -hmm. We want to continue to raise awareness mm -hmm. of mental health and for people to understand the fantastic work that you're doing um, at your organization. Mm -hmm. Before we go, um, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Issy. Um, always a pleasure being on set with you ladies. Um, before we go, do ensure that you listen to our podcast on Spotify. Follow us on Instagram at Show Africa. You can interact with us further. Drop a comment and most importantly, follow all our social media engagements. Remember to like, share, comment and invite your friends and family to watch us and follow us. If you missed today's quote, here it is again. I think that it's really important to take the stigma away from mental health. My brain and my heart are really important to me. I don't know why I wouldn't seek help to have those things be as healthy as my teeth. Couldn't have said it better. That's from Kerry Washington. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 8 p.m. as we bring another great conversation to your screen. Have a good evening. <laughs>